Don't f it up, Sean. You did it! Yay! Moonshine, Great Depression, Ford's V8, America. Whiskey, the action words of NASCAR. An automotive sport that is one of the largest passion times for Americans since the early 30s. I mean, who doesn't love watching a real life version of 007 while waiting for the world war to end? It's one of those things that was just a weird time for Americans, okay? I'm Alex, Alex at a fine Instagram, and today we're gonna be taking a shot. Looking back, son, at the most interesting histories of automotive culture that ended up being a race with only less tan turns. Ladies and gentlemen, today we're going to be coming in and talking and taking a look back at the history of NASCAR. If you've been here before, Yo, and if you haven't, double, double yo, 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 yo. And don't forget to subscribe. And if you're looking for aftermarket wheels, tires, or suspension, be sure to check us out over at fitmentindustries.com. We also have a huge gallery where you can enter in your entire year, make, and model and see what actually fits your car. For those that continuously watch our videos, I'm sorry for saying it over and over, but that's because you're not adding your car to the gallery. And it makes it super easy for you to pick up a wheel and tire package. I think mean, that's kind of what we're known for. And of course, now we got a thing on our website where you can actually see what can get to you in 10 days or less because the world is crazy and I have to wait in line to buy wheat bread. So let us in the comments, by the way, what you think about NASCAR. Do you watch it? Do you like it? Do you hate it? We would just be really interested to hear because it's just one of those things. Deborah, the Roaring Twenties are incredible. We have, but we have nothing to drink. It sucks ass. I know, Junior. I know it does. If we could just wash our sorrows away with alcohol, but that's illegal. All we can do is listen to the neighbor keep saying old sport. For some reason, the other neighbor won't turn off his dock light. Not anymore, Deborah. Not anymore. That's the entire, if you guys wanted to know what the entire Prohibition era was like, I just told you. That's the entire history of Lennison. Because Jonathan would then go to get involved in some of the most dangerous and illegal activities of the early 20th century, running moonshine as a bootlegger. You see, what if I told you that there was a time in the past where alcohol was actually illegal for some reason, and you could get some serious jail time? The 18th Amendment at the time prohibited the sale of alcohol, and if you were going through one of the fastest growth periods the world had ever seen with a nation that was practically brand new and had new things coming about it more faster than you could ever imagine, you probably want a white claw too. So as a result, and in tandem with the growth of motorized vehicles in America, an illegal business model would be birthed. Farmers would create liquor, most commonly moonshine, and hire runners or bootleggers to transfer the liquid gold from farm to purchasers. It was a pretty simple mentality. Make it, sell it, don't get caught. And for a while, it worked really well without much like official police interference. Until the demand for alcohol scaled so greatly that in some areas of the country, bootlegging was the only supply chain that had continuous cash flow and as a result, caused officials to begin establishing sting operations to crush the illegal trade. Inherently, there was so much money going through this that the money wasn't being seen in other major parts of like commercial business. Junior, it's getting too dangerous. You can't keep up on these midnight runs. Never. I know. That's why I swapped out the stock motor with an ambulance V8. Not only that, but press this button here and nail balls fall out of the back of the bumper. Oh, Junior, you're so ravishing. Part two of the part one, because that also happened. That was actually a thing. Like 007 got their thing from these guys because vehicles would become more equipped to handle the police and bandits. That their goal was nothing more than hand out 20 year sentences and like flyers to anyone running liquor or steal the liquor themselves. These bootleggers like Junior would continue to modify their Ford with higher power motors, inherently swapping out ambulance V8s out of their stock Fords and sometimes doing complete swaps, electric cutouts that would throw oil, smoke and tack bombs behind them if they were being pursued at night and they'd modify their trunks to fit as much moonshine as humanly possible. It was like the 20th century Wild West, and I'm not kidding when I say they did all of this in the dead of night. Because the illegal required some of the best drivers in the Appalachian Mountains, it was only natural that over time, groups of bootleggers began to be known for their driving skill and maneuverability that wasn't matched by anyone with a badge. They were some of the best, fastest, and riskiest players in the entire game. Even after the bootleg business survived through Prohibition, it didn't stop the business at all because even with its legal structure the taxes made the trade extremely uncompetitive which just furthered the business more and during this time there were some common names who really began growing into seeing another market grow that was a little bit kind of sort of slightly more legal which was called 
racing. Runners, mechanics, tire companies, and even Ford, a then antagonist to the alcohol business, began coming together to continue the illegal trade in some way, shape, and form. Mechanics worked with the runners to make their cars as fast as humanly possible using new tires that were created by tire companies that were specifically making these tires for illegal runs on terrible roads, trying to ensure that the flex of the bias, the actual rubber, could survive the harsh driving. Ford was even making it illegal for consumption by employees, but they also, like unintentionally, created one of the most revolutionary motors for moonshining, the flathead V8. These cars would become more dangerous, quick, and now good enough to not only run during the nighttime with the headlights off, but also during the day. People began running these races during the day, and although people had attempted to create an event to try and like do things that were also legal to kind of come together and race around, maybe not illegally for moonshine, it was never really that good, until a man by the name of Bill France would be one of the first to do so profitably. And it did it through a new organization that was founded in December of 1946 and called it the National Association for Stock Car Auto Racing, NASCAR. Now, NASCAR wasn't first, but it was the one that would establish rules, guidelines, and work with local landscape to ensure that the events could be conducted legally and without police interference. Because you have to remember back then, most racers were bootleggers, and a lot of times it carried a negative connotation with them. Oh, Junior, be careful racing. I don't want you to crash. Deborah, don't worry worry about me. I'm turning to make history by turning left constantly. Junior and others would be headhunted by Bill to begin participating in the NASCAR circuit and its very first event in Daytona. The first place winner, Red Byron, a former moonshine runner. And while the moonshine business helped kickstart the stock car racing in the United States through NASCAR and other unofficial associations, Bill wanted to separate the two entities or ideas as far away as possible as to relinquish any negativity or connotation with the new event and organization. Hence why you really didn't hear about NASCAR's connections to moonshine for nearly three decades later through an official statement released by NASCAR themselves. It wasn't something they wanted to be known for, which makes sense. NASCAR continued to scale year over year, with Bill securing sponsorship deals with businesses rather than relying on moonshine dollars to pay the racetrack. And while it dissuaded some of the legacy racers to continue with the organization, people like Byron, it laid the necessary framework for NASCAR to become what we know about it today, which is pretty neat. What if NASCAR made tracks that weren't so old? Who said that? Who said that. Over time, NASCAR turned into a national pastime sport for automotive enthusiasts here in the United States. It was becoming the thing to watch. Growing from just a few thousand followers to millions of viewers in an extremely short time span. Growing from hosting tracks to building tracks and laying the framework for additional racing series to be developed due to the success of NASCAR in North America. It was America's pastime and it was the first to host an official 500 mile race. By 1989, every NASCAR race was televised and in 2016, Daytona had over 11 million viewers on average to watch the race. NASCAR was huge. And NASCAR would help establish and grow the aftermarket community scene with it. I mean, they had plenty of racers and enthusiasts and viewers wanting to build their own car and motorcycles to the likes of Wendell Scott and Buck Baker. You had companies like Edelbrock, American Racing, Wyan, and more would come together to satisfy like this lust for horsepower and go off to form their own associations and enthusiast groups and companies and parts and products. Because guess what? You want to watch people go around a track going left consistently? Well, guess what? Well, you're also going to want to do that when you stop watching that because it's like watching Fast and Furious when you're 16 years old. And it all comes back to Junior in the early 20th century just trying to get his whistle wet. The humble beginnings of NASCAR are one that ooze American history. The drive to have whatever you wanted regardless of what anybody told you. The debauchery of late night driving with no lights on to just evade the local police to run things that you probably shouldn't. The decision to plant and stand true to the heritage of the racing sport while ensuring a promising future for those enthusiasts that loved to watch watch the drivers. Everything about it, everything about the story and history of NASCAR is badass. And NASCAR is badass. It's a country in its own right when you're at an event and the exact thing you'd expect from a country that can sell you burgers for a buck oh six and a 30 rack of bush for $14.99. It's everything that those statements embody. But what do you think about NASCAR? Let us know below and of course if you're looking for aftermarket wheels, tires, or suspension or wheel and tire packages that get mounted and balanced and shipped to your door for free, be sure to check us out over at fitmanindustries.com. We won't judge you when you want to put a 215 on a 10 wide. Just saying. I'm Alan from Fitment Industries, and we will see you later. Peace.